chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. <clears throat> when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to <clears throat> come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so they began, began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed.
the garment district. I think I've never driven across the garment district before. Where is this thing taking? And so we are, we're beginning to turn to the garment district. It's just what they show in the movies. It is crowded with trucks and cars and taxis and people pushing garment things, you know, and, and, and those, those, those little bins on it. The, and they are all over everywhere. And I'm walking faster than traffic moves across that part of Manhattan. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And we finally got, you know, out to the other side. There was a bridge I never heard of. Or somehow we got over and, and made it all right. But ever since then, I go with my GPS on the phone.
which is the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Story picks up again. He's returning from synagogue again with who? With Simon. <coughs> he knows Simon before this event. And Luke. <coughs> Simon invites him to come, you know, for an after synagogue meal. They get to the home. <coughs> Simon's mother in law is ill. She has a fever. Jesus um, puts out the demon. Simon witnesses the exorcism. Jesus does another exorcism. And then, this story. Who's the main actor in the story? Well, Jesus is clearly the main actor in the story. But right alongside him is Simon Peter. Jesus is preaching. What is he preaching? Well, it's probably not much different from what he said in, to Nazareth. I mean, he's a, an itinerant preacher. I've done this before. You end up having some stock sermons. You, 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 don't, you don't make a new one until you've got to go back to the beginning of your sermon. So it's probably the same sermon. Here's Isaiah. This is who I am. Believe in me. And people are flocking to the message. Jesus is being crowded into the water. There's Simon. He knows Simon. He gets into his boat so he can back off a little bit. And he keeps preaching. And then when he's done, he turns and says to Simon, Go back out. I'll show you where to make a catch. Now, at this point, we've got to bring in our own perspective about this. Now, even though I've been, you know, a professional, educated seminary grad all these years, my roots are really very good call. I worked my way through college over in Youngstown uh, in a glass shop around lasers. You know what lasers do? They cut glass, they install windows, they put in the great big you know, windows and, and construction and so forth. And uh, there I am, a college kid, working around the lasers, worse yet, my great uncle owns the business. So I'm not only that college brat, I'm also the relative. <coughs> the relative. And all I had to do was make some mistake or say something stupid. Ah, there's the relative again. You know. Now if I had to earn my way into that blue collar fellowship, they did find out that I could cut a straight line with a glass cutter and it would be okay. You know, but I had to earn my way. What does Jesus think he's doing going into setting with crap, you know, fishermen saying, oh boy, I have to put out. The thing that was pretty brash about it is that fishing on any lake is best done at night. There's a whole temperature inversion thing that happens in lakes where the warm water that happens during the day is at the top, but there's not as much oxygen there. The fish like to breathe underwater. So they go to where there's cool walks. At night, that changes. The cool water comes to the, it comes to the surface and so do the fish. So that's when they're out there fishing. But here comes this, you know, the seminary guy saying, no, no, we don't go fishing during the day. You know, it's probably 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, Simon does Jesus enough to say to him, uh, We've already been out all night. There was nothing to catch when it was the best of conditions. But, have a difference to you. Or, so I'm thinking, one, one book. Now, in the band, and in every other picture that I looked at from medieval times, uh, the boats that they depicted look like they're about from here uh, to here. About room for two people, maybe three, plus a few fish. But actually, these fish are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go back to being in synagogue with Jesus. Go back to the healing of his mother-in-law. 
go back to being privileged to host Jesus on his boat and hear the teaching once again. And having it come so close that Jesus enters into that tight circle of blue collar fishermen. <coughs> that tight circle, the big run circle. It's coming into the plumbers union, Paul. Okay? It's coming into the sewing circle, ladies. Okay? It's coming into the, the nurse's station, if that's what you do. I don't, whatever you're reading, it, it, it's, it's coming into, you know, 10th grade classroom. Jesus is entering into your world and is trying to show you that this is something that's going to yield something far beyond any of your expectations. But you see how it had to be nurtured in Peter? All these things have happened. Here's what today is about. What if? What if? The Holy Spirit is active in your life in such a way that God is trying to get your attention in a way that will bump you off of dead center and get you out of your own world and into God's. What if? God is after you the way he was after you. Over the years, um, it's been said and I've observed that people are having spiritual experiences all the time. That there are experiences of awe and fear and humility there are times in which we feel especially graced and blessed, like the bell part of this morning, you know, um, with the birth of your child or grandchild, the time in which you have experienced great love and great challenge. That people have spiritual experiences all the time. You know the last place that they will talk about those experiences? We don't talk about it in the church. There is no arena to talk about it in the church. We don't trust each other enough to talk about it in the church. You have to wonder what we're really about. Is this, this a place where Christianity is practiced? Or is it some kind of churchy end? Is this a place where we've gotten so comfortable in our fellowship that we've forgotten what we're about? Has, has this become a place where we, well, we know each other, we're comfortable, we, we know what to do one month to the next. Uh, we kind of keep the, the, you know, the, the wheels turning here and uh, squeaky wheels get greased and put out so that everything is stable and quiet and predictable. So we're not asked to do too much. God forbid that any of you should sign up for more than one thing on the let's do it together first. God forbid. What if, what if the Holy Spirit is trying to boost you to the same place as Simon Peter and James and John? No, 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 we don't want to go. What did they leave behind? What did it say? What did they leave behind? Everything. No, 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 we, we like things to be balanced. I'm, I'm, I want my church to be on church, uh, church morning, you know, and then only when it's convenient for me to be in church. But you better be there when I come back now. Right? Uh, you know, on my terms. This is supposed to be on my terms and not anybody else's. That's the way we like. Leaving behind everything is not on Peter's terms, I'm sorry. So if... If you're willing to entertain the possibility that the Holy Spirit is working on you to become a more fully devoted follower of Christ, then the next question is, what are you, what are you going to leave behind? What will you leave behind? Because you can't take everything with you. It's like being a backpacker. 
You know, you think, oh, what if I need, 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 next thing you know, you've got 60 pounds of stuff stuffed into your backpack, and it's all, you know? 25, 30 pounds max, I never was able to do that when I was back. 40. And after 40, it's all. Oh. Can't bring it all. What do you leave behind? What cross are you willing to pick up? And what superfluous junk are you ready to leave behind? That is crucial to your call. And what happens to James and John and Peter happens all the time. I believe that that Holy Spirit is working on you to deepen your relationship with God in Christ. That grace, the grace that Peter experienced in the healing of going to synagogue of Jesus, of the healing of his mother-in-law, of hearing Jesus teach, and finally having seen for himself the incredible payoff of being in relationship with Jesus on his own terms, in his own life, in the symbolism that he understood. Jesus is doing that for you. You may not be seeing it. The truth of our faith is you may not see it until you begin to step into Trust a little bit first. Listen to the preacher. Live it. And see what happens. I'm going way over today. I'm sorry. We support the Feed My Sheep uh, Soup Kitchen. If you've never been down there, I urge you to free up a Friday morning and talk to Nagua and go down and home. Here's what you're going to see. You're in First City, a small group of volunteers who just work their mm. off Friday mornings to get ready for lunch. There's some people that are there every Friday. There are some people that are there, you know, once or twice. Um, I was only down there once, but I saw what I, what I saw there. I saw it at the soup kitchens where people who are motivated out of their love for God and Christ to do this, to make sure that people are fit. Jesus said this was a sign of the kingdom. We're giving the sign of the kingdom. And when, when the people, are, when they're ready to serve, you have people standing behind the tables and the counters who are encountering people coming in from the streets and offering them understanding and welcome and humor and help. They're, they're treating them like, like just human beings. And they come in and they, they, they have all different kinds of looks. They're, you know, they're African American, they're Asian, they're uh, European American, they're Hispanic. They're coming in. And you, have you ever been there? I don't know. But, you know, to have to come in and find some place to at least can I have something to eat. Think you could do that? Not easy. Come. Some of them come in with their children. Might be their only meal of the day. Probably their only hot meal of the day. Welcome. Here's what we have. They're ready to have um, you know, containers. They take something home. All goes. All goes. Now the fellowship of the people behind the counter. <laughs> pretty cool, right, Jim? You know, great fellowship. You know, everybody's cooperating, and if there's somebody new, there's you know, oh, you're included here. Let's see if you can do this, you can do this. And not does a great job of holding all the volunteers into that. But the other thing I've noticed over the years since I've done this is the fellowship amongst the people who come in. It would not be this way were it not for what's going on behind the counter. You make people, oh, what are you doing? You, know, you, you, know, you should be grateful. Da, 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 da. After the prayer, people start relating to each other. They know each other. And if they don't know each other, there's a kindness. They're reaching out to one another. They're sharing. They've got their own thing going. 
That's for offering somebody my God hot dog and green beans. One fish. And to have love and alleviation of suffering and a little bit of justice is the catch that almost breaks the nets. See what I'm saying? And Jesus wants you in that equation. The world needs you to be in that equation. In whatever arena you walk around in, your occupational life, your recreational life, your school life, I don't care. That flavor of life is so needed out there. The call continues to be issued. The question is, will you become aware of the tug that God has is trying to work on you? And will you be willing to put other stuff aside? Your politics, your fear, your, your attachment to, to your, own, your own way and step into Jesus' way. That's a question. It feels like it's time for an altar call. What do you think? <laughs> the altar's in your heart, folks. That call is real.